Rather, meaning is a certain kind of psychological experience, a subjective no. psychological experience, something that you find meaningful, I may not find meaningful. That's obvious enough, but yet people keep searching for meaning. And we have the metaphor from several thousand years of being a seeker of meaning, which I think is a mistake. And I think we have to make the paradigm shift to being a maker of meaning. Hello, beautiful people. On today's podcast, we have the wonderful Eric Maisel. Eric is a retired family therapist, now regarded as America's foremost creativity coach. He is the developer of the philosophy of life called Curism and is also the author of over 50 books, including Lighting the Way, Redesign Your Mind, and Fearless Creating. What I personally love about this conversation is our exploration into meaning and purpose. I feel meaning and purpose are both experiences that are necessary for a fulfilling life, but are indeed experiences that we don't always feel in touch with. So it is in this conversation that I get Eric to be really specific about how we can become informed and take action. We also explore creativity and discuss some strategies that I can personally say I'm integrating into my own life on how to show up, deliver, and maintain consistency in that. Please enjoy this wonderful conversation with the lovely Eric. Welcome to the podcast, Eric. Great to be here. So Eric, where I would love to start is with a quote from your book, Why Smart People Hurt. In natural psychology, we say, look to a meaning problem before you look to a medical problem, a psychological problem, or a so-called mental disorder. I would love for you to elaborate, Eric, on why this is important. Golly, jumping in the deep end of the pool. (laughs) I am. (laughs) First, I have to explain my take on meaning. Mm. I don't believe that meaning is out there, that it's anything objective. There is no meaning to life. Rather, meaning is a certain kind of psychological experience, a subjective Mm. psychological experience, something that you find meaningful, I may not find meaningful. That's obvious enough, but yet people keep searching for meaning. And we have the metaphor from several thousand years of being a seeker of meaning, which I think is a mistake. And I think we have to make the paradigm shift to being a maker of meaning, from seeking meaning to making meaning. Given that meaning is only a psychological experience, it naturally comes and goes. And this is a big deal idea because people get worried when life doesn't feel meaningful. But in fact, it's not going to feel meaningful X percent of the time. And the mature take on that is meaning will come back, that it's a renewable resource, an evergreen resource, and we can get it back by remembering what we experienced as meaningful previously and doing that same sort of thing again. This is all by way of saying meaning is a certain kind of state that we can coax into existence, that we can cultivate, and when it's gone, we don't feel good. It will come back, but it doesn't feel good to have it be gone. And that's in loose language, a meaning crisis. And when we experience a meaning crisis or an existential crisis, we do the sorts of things that people do. We drink too much. We shop too much. We whatever it is we do to flee the encounter, to, to flee the experience of meaninglessness and to flee the next encounter of responsibility of being a free person. Existential thought, and I'm, that's my background, is sort of an existential thought of the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And in fact, what I do is kind of an updated existentialism. Existential, sto- existential thought's main idea was take personal responsibility mm-hmm. for your life, including, to circle all the way back around to the quote, including to not adopt one of those labels that's so easy to adopt nowadays, to call yourself ADD or this or that. PTSD, bipolar, whatever, rather than adopting that label, which is not, by the way, a diagnosis, it's not medicine, it's just a labeling game. Mm. And you can tell that I have a particular take on this. I don't believe that the mental disorders described in the DSM and the ICD, which are the two Bibles of diagnosing, are legitimate. I don't believe either of those documents are legitimate. I believe they're shopping guides for 
mental health professionals where you can find a label to affix to a person. So rather than you, the per, you the individual, gra glomming onto, grabbing onto one of those labels, don't do it. Mm. Use some old fashioned language. Don't say you have clinical depression, say you're in despair. Right. Because when you start to use normal language like sadness or despair, then you better understand what's going on. It's not a neurotransmitter problem, it's that you hate your job or you're right. in a bad relationship or the world's screwed up. It's that sort of thing, rather than you have a mental disorder or mental disease or mental illness. So that's all by way of saying, there's too much mental disorder labeling and not enough understanding of what it means to make meaning and coax meaning back into existence. Mm. And how does this play into the line of positive thinking? Because I know in relation to depression, you sort of um, explain it as this persistent negative evaluation of life. So how do you sort of lead, you know, your clients and the people in your life sort of in this other direction? It connects to my take on life purpose. So similarly to believing we need a paradigm shift from seeking meaning to making meaning, I think we need a paradigm shift from the idea of the purpose of life to the idea of life purposes, of multiple life purposes that are, mm -hmm. are that are that are our choices to make. So if I sit with a client and start to talk like this about life purposes, they'll get it and they'll be able to identify and name their life purposes. It's not that I need a menu or a list from them, but just in the chatting, they get the idea that many things are important to them. And a typical list might be service and activism and career and creativity and children and the things we could name. They're, they're not startling things. But most people have not made that list and don't think about getting their life purpose choices onto their daily to-do list. That's the trick in life, is to not just be doing your errand to-do list, but your life purposes to-do list. If you can do three or four or five things on your life purposes to-do list each day, life, you'll experience life as meaningful, and you'll be, if not not depressed, less depressed or less despairing, because you will have made yourself proud by your efforts. And I think that's the game we're in. It's not to be happy, but to make ourselves proud by our efforts. For me, it, I have a simple life purpose axiom or statement, which is do the next right thing. And I think if people adopt that idea that it, they're in charge of doing the next right thing in their life, that they have to identify what's important and then actually get to those important things, all of that reduces the experience of anxiety and depression, both of those things. And so is that what meaning is, is to identify what is important in your life and act in alignment with that? That's a way to meaning. That is something that you experience as important is likely to be more meaningful than something that you don't experience as important. But there's no guarantee that anything in particular is going to be experienced as important, just as there's no guarantee that anything is going to be experienced as joyful. Mm -hmm. You would not expect a constant diet of joy in life. You would not expect it. You would not mm -hmm. expect a constant diet of meaningfulness in life either, if you think about it. And so... That's the idea, is that meaning, if, if meaning comes and goes, the best we can do is to try to do those things that we might experience as meaning, meaningful. I have two phrases around this. One is meaning investments, and that's the idea of spending time on things that might be important. And then the idea of meaning opportunities, that is trying things out that you just sort of guessing might be meaningful. You're hazarding the guess without a guarantee that starting on a novel or doing X, Y, and Z might prove meaningful, might not. The arduousness of the work might stop it from feeling meaningful. When mm -hmm. something gets too hard, it stops feeling meaningful. So those two ideas, meaning opportunities and meaning investments are part of this picture of trying to coax meaning into existence. And I love that you've mentioned, you know, the ability to kind of write these down and act to them in a daily practice. And I also know that you mention mindfulness being important to this as a daily activity as well. Can you speak to how we can bring mindfulness into our lives in relation to bringing more meaning into our own lives? 
Well, I have my version of this, which is not about meditation. Often the, those two words get connected, meditation mm -hmm. and mindfulness. For me, there's a step beyond what, what cognitive therapists do, which is look at what you say, look at your thoughts, and try to have you change those thoughts. For me, the bigger idea is to change the source of those thoughts. And so I just did a book called Redesign Your Mind. And the idea there is to actually envision your mind as a room and redesign it and redecorate it. Mm -hmm. So you put in windows so that it's a less stuffy place, or you get rid of that bed of nails that you've been lying on and replace it with an easy chair. That is, you visualize a happier mind, a better mind, a mind that functions better for you. And then the thoughts that arise in that mind are going to serve you better. So to me, that's a, that's a big idea version of mindfulness is being able to visualize your mind as a room and actually change it, redesign it, and redecorate it. And what have you found has been uh, most impactful, successful in terms of your clients' lives? You mentioned uh, a little earlier about sort of this chronic meaning crisis. And I've sort of got here, you've mentioned in your book, you know, this leads to this sort of self-soothing activities that turn into obsessions, compulsions, or addictions. What do you feel like has helped throughout your experience in helping others the most with sort of the depths of these compulsions, obsessions, and addictions? Well, there are many different things. Um, one, people have to learn anxiety management tools that work for them because mm. what you do when you feel anxious typically is flee the encounter. You get out of there. The right. thing that's making you anxious makes you anxious and you want to get out of there. So you go to one of those soothing activities, whatever it might be. So embracing the idea that anxiety is natural and then learning how to manage it are two key ingredients of not going down the road of addiction. Um, I provide lots of anxiety management tools in a book called Mastering Creative Anxiety. There are, because I work, because I've been working with creative and foreign artists for 30 or 40 years, their particular anxieties interest me, including going into the unknown and the particular anxiety that comes with having to make choices, because that's what the creative process is, mm -hmm. one choice after another, which actually most creatives don't understand. They don't understand that they're leaving their novel behind because they don't want to send, they don't know whether to send their character to Paris or Zanzibar. They just, they don't want to make that next choice. So to flee that encounter, to flee that anxiety making encounter, they leave their novel for a day, a week, a month, or a year. Mm -hmm. So anxiety management tools ma matter. Love matters. You mentioned before my notion of most people or many people having given life a thumbs down at some point rather than a thumbs up. And that's what people do. They, they've gotten the idea that life is a cheat. They, they had some dream. Maybe they kind of knew they could never have that dream, but they still had it anyway. They may have grown up in a situation where they kind of knew they couldn't have the thing they want, but still they held it as a dream, whether it was to be a dancer or a scientist or run a business or whatever it was, they had a dream. And then over time, they began to see how difficult it was to realize that dream dash may be impossible and gave life a thumbs down. And so began to, to use vernacular, began to hate life. The way to circle back around is to love again. And one of the things that I try to help clients with, especially my creative clients, is to remember what they loved at five, six, and seven. Those were true loves. You know, sitting in a corner reading a book for my peeps, that was that was an experience that has not really dimmed over time. That still was important and can be important again. So trying to remember our early loves, that's a way back from the pain that we're currently feeling, that so many of us are feeling because of world events and personal events and COVID and everything else. Anxiety management, Recovering love, returning to love, those are two headline pieces. And I love that you've mentioned creativity uh, because, I mean, I feel like in my own personal life over the years, there's an element of perfectionism that certainly stops me in my place. And through developing even this podcast, that's sort of been, you know, an action with the thumbs up that, you know, I can do things without them being perfect all the time. But 
in your book, you do sort of explain creativity as this lifelong process that demands mistakes and messes. Can you please speak more to that? Only a percentage of the things we do will be any good. It takes a lot of maturity to accept that. Mm -hmm. But if you think about, I don't know, anybody you might like, a Bob Dylan, how many of his thousands of songs are wonderful? 20, 30, some percentage of the whole. If you're a fan of Bach cantatas, and then there are hundreds of Bach cantatas, five or six or seven or eight are brilliant. And the rest are, let's say, ordinary. Folks have trouble understanding this or accepting this reality. Naturally, you would start working on something with the hope that it will be excellent, but you can't attach to the outcome. Right. You can have hopes for the thing, you can have ambitions for the thing, you can have dreams for the thing, but you can't need it to work because only a percentage of the things we try will work. Mm -hmm. So I have to alert <laughs> clients to that fact that many of the things they try will not work and they have to be way easier with mistakes and messes than they usually are. Intellectually, they get it. Who doesn't get that? that they're gonna be mistakes and messes. Viscerally, they hate it. Mm -hmm. They just hate the idea that they might spend a year and a half on a novel that's a mess. Who wants that? Mm -hmm. But that's the process. Right. Book one may be a mess. Book two may be brilliant. Book three may be a mess. Book four may be brilliant. That's why I often do this with my hands, which is a shelf full of books. It's a body of work. We're actually aiming as creative people for a body of work, some of which is wonderful and a lot of which is not wonderful. It's just ordinary. And how do we bring meaning in with creativity, when you're sort of coaching your clients, do you sort of come from this aspect of bringing meaning into the experience and action of creativity rather than as you're suggesting, attaching that meaning to the outcome? You can't bring meaning anywhere. Mm. Just, just to observe your language, it can't be brought. Mm. It can be coaxed into existence. It can be hoped for, but it's not mm. like, a wallet you can put in your back pocket and bring right. someone with you. You can't bring meaning to it. What you can do, though, is remember that the experience of creating has felt meaningful previously and has some likelihood of feeling meaningful again. It's a guess. Mm -hmm. It's really, it's a lower guess than the sun rising tomorrow. The odds of the sun rising tomorrow are pretty good. The odds of your current novel feeling meaningful are just 50-50. It may or may not feel meaningful. So meaning is not the holy grail. Right. Folks have to not care so much about meaning and rather circle back around to their life purposes. Mm -hmm. It's much more important to live your life purposes than to be squeamish about or hunting for meaning. Mm -hmm. And take, this takes some time to get because people have been sort of indoctrinated with the idea that meaning is super important. If I don't have meaning in my life, I don't have a life. I should despair. If I don't have meaning in my life, I should despair. No. If you're living your life purposes, irrespective of whether those life purposes bring you the experience of meaning, you're living the right life. And as you suggest, I mean, I feel like most of us have grown up with this idea that we should have meaning permanently in our lives. And you're sort of suggesting that it ebbs and flows with, with life. Yep. What do you suggest in those moments that we may wake up on a certain day or, you know, be doing something in particular that we don't feel that sense of meaning? Do we just continue on or is there a practice that you bring into your life? Sure. Let me return to the two phrases of meaning investments and meaning opportunities because that's where these arise. If you are aware of what has felt meaningful in the past, and that may be different from what you think has felt meaningful because when you first tackle this question, it's sort of, you sort of would think, well, maybe it's my PhD program that felt meaningful. And then you remember, no, that didn't feel meaningful at all. <laughs> it was completely not fun and not meaningful. So first you have to kind of identify what felt meaningful. And it will be things like holding your child's hand crossing the street. That's what mm -hmm. felt meaningful or going to the zoo with your child or having a conversation with Aunt Rose about the family where you learned a secret. That was meaningful. So having that repertoire 
or that understanding of what felt meaningful in the past gives you a clue about what you might try today. It might be calling Aunt Rose. Mm. It gives you a clue about what to do today. That is something that in the past provoked the experience of meaningful meaningfulness yeah. might feel meaningful today. So that's the idea of a meaning investment in something you kind of believe might produce the experience of meaning. Then there are meeting opportunities, which simply means trying something new that you think might provoke the experience of me. If you've always needed to wander the back streets of Paris and haven't done it yet and aren't too scared of COVID at this moment, maybe you need to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you need to stop everything, even though it's really hard to stop everything, and go do something that all along you've guessed would feel meaningful. There's no guarantee that it will. The back street of Paris may feel just like the back street of your town. Right. Or, or not. Or it may mm -hmm. feel very meaningful. All you can do is hazard a guess and then take the action that gives you the opportunity to experience meaning. By the way, on this subject, this is sort of a parenthesis, but when meaning has really drained out of something, it takes people a surprisingly long time to stop that thing, even though meaning has drained out of it. Interesting. I interviewed people about the subject, people, you know, talented, adult, semi-mature people. <laughs> um, and when meaning had drained out of something like college teaching no longer meant anything to them, or their religion no longer meant anything to them, big things, their relationships, their marriage. It took them on average five or six years to get out of the thing, wow. to quit teaching or to actually give up their religion or to actually leave the relationship five or six years. That's a long time to be in despair. Mm. That's a long time to be without meaning, be without sort of a core, the core meaning of that kind of relationship. So my headline there is, and I have a phrase for this that I try to sell to all clients sooner rather than later. Right. If you know you're going to do something five years from now, do it now. If you know the divorce is coming, if you know you're going to quit teaching, if you know that your religious order no longer holds meaning for you, try to get out sooner rather than later. Move on to the next meaning opportunity. And what do you think stops people generally from making those decisions or taking those actions uh, sooner rather than later? They don't believe that the next thing will be more meaningful or as meaningful mm -hmm. or meaningful. They, they, they don't have a good feeling about the next step. If you're um, in a relationship and need a divorce, well, you're going to be poorer after the divorce. Right. So there are practical considerations, practical reasons. For religious people, I, I, you know, I write in this territory, I did a book called The Atheist Way. Um, I believe that religion is a betrayal of our common humanity. I don't like it. So I like people to get out of it. But for people who do get out of it, what they experience as the worst aspect of getting out of it is a loss of community. Right. The loss of their church. It's not about God. It's about the loss of potluck dinners. And so they don't want to lose that. So there they are sort of being phony and still praising God, that praising God they don't believe in, but they 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 want the camaraderie. So there are lots of reasons why people stay where they are and don't make the change that they know they're going to make. Right. And you mentioned earlier that meaning is not the Holy Grail. Is yep. the Holy Grail life's purpose or like, is there a Holy Grail? I think the Holy Grail is making ourselves proud, being righteous to use a certain kind of language. Um, being happy with our efforts, our actions, what we're doing. I think that's the holy grail is, to put it a different way, um, I, I was born right after World War II. World War II was the dominant event of my childhood. And one of the anchoring metaphors of, of my childhood in World War II was the idea of being a resistance fighter. That just struck me as very important, mm -hmm. those resistance fighters in France, in Italy. And the, the dads of many of my pals, I grew up in New York City, a left-leaning progressive place. Many of the dads of my friends had fought in the Lincoln Brigade, which was that 
brigade that fought in the Spanish Civil War against Franco. This is all by way of saying the idea of being a resistance fighter struck a chord with me early on, and I always wanted to live my life that way, not fighting Nazis, but fighting humbug, just fighting things I didn't think made sense. Mm -hmm. So for, for me, the Holy Grail was adhering to that vision of doing the next right thing. Now, the Holy Grail would be something different for each person, the way you, it may be some family-centered thing or some service-centered thing. It could be construed any which way. It's a personal matter. But I do think that it's centrally doing the thing that makes ourselves proud. And I've read in your book that you state, you know, live your life like life matters, your efforts matter, and you matter. What do you think fuels people now and then, or for some people it may be more of a permanent experience to feel like, they don't matter or sort of nothing matters in their life? Those are two different things that they don't matter and that nothing matters. Um, that they don't matter. Well, who needs another photograph? Who needs another poem? Who needs it? That's the, that's the way the mind goes. Who needs another one of these things? Mm -hmm. The billion Instagram posts a minute. I'm, I'm supposed to start an Instagram thing to support my little thing that's so little that has seven followers and, and two likes and et cetera. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, it's easy to go down the rabbit hole of why bother. And when I work with clients around this, I try to remind them of a, of a phrase that the avant-garde artists of the turn of the last century used, which was an audience of one. That is the Picassos and Brocks, they would say, we're just after an audience of one. We don't expect the mass of mankind to understand cubism. We just want somebody to understand it. Now, they didn't mean that. They wanted billions of followers. They were egotists and narcissists and all of that. But that phrase did mean something, an audience of one. And I try to remind people that it's not a bad thing to move one other person's heart. That's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. That's better than sitting on your couch and doing nothing. That's still, there's an upside to serving one person, helping one person, adding a little love to one person's life. There's an upside to all of that. And that typically resonates with clients. They get it. Okay, let me stop thinking about this huge thing that I don't have, this massive, mm -hmm. I think Ariana Grande has a, quarter billion followers. Okay, I don't have a quarter billion followers. I've got seven followers or whatever. You've got to reframe that as okay. Mm, beautiful. I love that. So you developed a philosophy of life called Kirism. I hope I've pronounced that properly. Absolutely. Can you please share more about what that is? It's really all the things we've been chatting about. It's an updated existentialism that rises and falls on the ideas of the paradigm shift from making from seeking meaning to making meaning and from life mm. purpose to life purposes. It has a built-in daily practice piece to it. I think that we can't really honor our life purposes unless we're living our life purposes. And when we skip days living our life purposes, we end up skipping months and years. That's one of the dirty mm. secrets of life is that the second we stop doing something for a few days, it may be two years later that we exercise again or diet again or write our novel again, or it's a, we lose a lot of time. So it has elements of daily practice, ideas about meaning and life purpose, ideas around creativity, ideas around what we've been talking about, namely this doing the next right thing kind of idea, what it means to take personal responsibility for your life. Mm -hmm. There came a time in Sartre's life where he wrote an important essay on existentialism, in which he described where existentialism should go next, and then he didn't go there. He then, instead of going where existentialism needed to go next, he wrote a long biography of either Balzac or Flaubert, I can't remember who. He did something completely inauthentic, to use his own language, he did something completely inauthentic. Because he didn't, I think he didn't know where to go next with existentialism. So since then, and I, you know, I've been reading the existentialist since I was a kid, I've always wanted to take existentialism its next steps. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that that's what curism is. It's an updated existentialism with some new idiosyncratic ideas. Is it something that you feel like you're continually exploring and expanding? Oh, 
all all the time. Mm -hmm. I did a book book that supports Kirism. It's called Lighting the Way. Uh, let me tell you this story about learning all the time. So in the late or the mid to late 1990s, I had done a series of successful books with torture and was given kind of carte blanche to do the next book. And it, I, the books had been in the creativity area, but I wanted to do a meaning book, except I had no idea what I was talking about. I just didn't know what I know now. And so I wrote a book called Lighting the Way, which is why I've honored that book by calling the recent book Lighting the Way. It's an homage to the old writing the way, <laughs> Lighting the Way. So I did a book called Lighting the Way, which was really goofy. Every chapter was, was off and wrong. And I remember meeting with Jeremy Tarcher, who is an actual person, and the editor-in-chief, a woman whose name I forget, at the top of the mark or some, some hotel in San Francisco for a drink. And them asking me, how's the book going? And me saying, it's going great. Couldn't be better. And so when I turned it in, it was unpublishable. It was never published, and it was unpublishable. It was it was completely um, and they were apologetic. It was like, Eric, um, there's some interesting bits here, but what in God's name are you talking about? <laughs> so this is all by way of saying I've increased my understanding of what I want to say mm -hmm. about meaning over these whatever that is, 25 years, and will continue to do so. What is that experience life? Because I, I do reflect on this in my own life. If I were to you know, produce something and put it out there. There is an element of growth in my life that I feel like every day I'm learning and updating. How do you as a creative get comfortable with putting work out, but also understanding that, you know, in the future, that work may be different to what you believe at that point in time? By saying to myself exactly what you just said. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a cognitive bit about, um, some books may stand the test of time. I've done beautiful object books that I have no problem standing behind to this day. And then I have books that, yeah, okay, <laughs> neither, <laughs> neither here nor there, that, that's mm. fine. But I think the main thing is um, I wouldn't dream of looking back. I wouldn't dream of thinking the thought that you just uttered. It wouldn't mm. pop into my head. Just as in whatever this is, 50 years of put, being in public, public world, I've never replied to a piece of criticism yet, ever, wow. once. Beautiful I don't know practice. what people are saying. That's it. It's a beautiful practice. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't have time to go. People who criticize have time, time on their hands, and they will go down a rabbit hole so deep that you, if you go down there with them, you, you may never reappear. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of creatives go down that rabbit hole because actually fighting some hand-to-hand -hand combat in that rabbit hole is easier for them than writing their next book. It, it's it's a, somehow a soothing, even as painful as it is, it's a soothing distraction. So for me, I, I really don't look back at that stuff and I don't, I don't address or reply to any. My favorite kind of criticism is how can you write so beautifully as an atheist? I love that. Wow, interesting. <laughs> and I have no reply to that. I would not mm -hmm. reply. To, I do not reply to such emails or, or anything like that. And when you create and produce, you mentioned earlier sort of this idea of, you know, visualizing sort of just producing for one person mm -hmm. and that can kind of help people. Is that mm -hmm. something that you, you utilize in your own life or do you do something different? Oh, absolutely. Because many of my books uh, do not reach many readers and they take the same amount of effort. For instance, mm -hmm. I'm the lead editor on a, on a series that I proposed to Ethics International Press called, now called, the Ethics International Press Critical Psychology and Critical Psychiatry series. And it's a series of books that will go on till the end of time while I still have a breath that looks critically at psychology and psychiatry. These books are gonna reach 200 people, 300 people, 400 people, not a lot of people. They're priced because they're, they're from a niche academic publisher. They're priced at like a hundred pounds. What ordinary person is gonna buy this book? N nobody. But I'm still perfectly okay with understanding that that's part of my body of work, part of my contribution, that that's worth doing. Mm. I love so that. I, I'm very easy with doing things that reach only a few people or that reach one person. And I know that personal responsibility is important to you. 
And it's certainly something the last couple of years for me that I've sort of, you know, for me, I sort of show up 100% responsibility these days or try my best to. And it certainly oh, yeah. changed my life probably most significantly out of anything else that I've incorporated into my life in terms of self-development. In your own life and with your clients, what is the difference you see particularly with people that sort of embrace this element of personal responsibility versus not? You mean what character-wise or personality-wise? I suppose the impact on people's life and, you know, even in relation to meaning as well, do you see an element of personal responsibility being um, tied in with having more meaning in your life? Oh, sure. Um, if you have dreams, goals, ambitions, life purposes, to say it simply, important stuff you want to do and you do it, you feel better. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean there isn't also a downside if the thing you do is criticized or if you're now pressured that your next thing be as good. Or There are lots of problems with success, but still there are more problems with a lack of success than with success. Mm -hmm. So getting the things done that you intend to get done feels good. Everything comes with shadows in life, but still it feels good to get things done. And, um, you know, that's what I'm promoting in clients. That's the difference between a core difference. There are many differences, but a core difference between therapy and coaching is a therapy client is okay coming in every week, saying the same old thing and doing nothing. Mm -hmm. That's a feature of therapy where there's no built in demand that you go do something. It's about insight, let's call it, if that's what mm -hmm. it is, but it's about insight. Coaching is about action. You know, it's about you telling me what you're going to get done this week and then me monitoring that. And, and next week, we see if you did it. And if you didn't, maybe we'll recalibrate. Maybe 30 minutes of working on your novel was too much in your busy life. Maybe it has to be 15 minutes, blah, blah, blah. You know, we'll recalibrate that. But we're going to be right on top of getting things done. And in coming full circle from where we first started, can you share more about this concept of humane helping? Again, another big subject. So the average time currently that a new patient, we'll call this person a patient, but it's not the right name, that a patient spends with a psychiatrist is 15 minutes. That's the average first session. What could possibly go on in 15 minutes except a checklist kind of thing and a prescription? And that is what mm -hmm. goes on. There's nothing about the person in that interaction. For me, hum humane helping means understanding that I'm a person and you're a person and that, we're, and that I need to inquire to understand what's going on. I don't understand what's going on by virtue of going down a symptom checklist, that that tells me nothing. The very idea that five things somehow go together and make mental, that if you're eating too much or too little and that you're tired, and that this and that and this, that that amounts to this mental disorder called depression, none of that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. It could be five different reasons. One reason why you're tired, one reason why you're eating, what could be different, et cetera. I have to check in with you to know what the heck is going on. And that's the, the essence of humane helping is me not being an expert, but me just being a person with you and us co-creating our understanding of what's going on. Beautiful. I guess that's a headline for what I'm, what I'm trying to get at there. And so wrapping up here, Eric, I would love to know for people that are listening, that are really curious about creating more meaning in their life and being more practical about their life purposes, what is an easy action that they can bring into their life today to start bringing more meaning and purpose into their life? Start the day doing something which has the prospect of being meaningful. So for mm -hmm. my for my um, creativity coaching clients, I need them to start their day creating. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's going to be for many clients a new thing. And I tell them there are three reasons for that. A is you get a lot of work done. I mean, if you start your day every day creating, you get a lot of work done. B is you get to make use of your sleep thinking, which is a whole nother subject. I did a book called Sleep Thinking. And the idea there is your brain will work on your creative work 
while you sleep, but that the work it does will evaporate if you turn to the new day. So if you can turn to your creative work first thing, you can make use of what your brain has been working on during the night, which is a big deal. It's a big subject and a big deal. And then the third idea is that by having done something meaningful first thing, you'll have built up some meaning capital for the day and the rest of the day can feel half meaningless and you won't get depressed. Mm -hmm. So the simplest thing for a person to do is to start their day. And this, I have to do parentheses here. This may mean shifting some other important thing like your journaling, your yoga, your Tai Chi, your whatever, it may mean shifting that to another time of the day so that you can turn to your creative work first thing and make some meaning first thing. I love it. And I love that you mentioned sleep thinking because I actually have a note here that you describe it as going to bed with a wonder, not a worry. Could you give an example of that? Sure. Uh, well, we know what a worry is. <laughs> <laughs> going to bed with wonder is wondering inside your work. Like, let's say you're working on a novel. It would be, I wonder what Mary would like to say to John in chapter three. Mm -hmm. How is she going to get her point across to him? Your brain will run with that in in REM sleep, your brain is dreaming. In non-REM sleep, it's thinking. And you'll have several non-REM sleep periods during the night. And you, you, Mary and John will have a conversation. Your brain will work out what they want to say to each other. Then, if you turn to your novel first thing, you can just take dictation. Which is, that's one of those blissful places to be for writers. You don't have to write. You just take dictation because your brain has worked it out. Beautiful. Well, thank you, Eric, for this wonderful conversation. Um, I've learned so much from you and it's been such a pleasure to read a couple of your books. Um, certainly got a long way to go if I want to read all of them, but um, I really honor you and your insights and your opinions and I'm learning a lot from you. So thank you, Eric. Thanks so much for having me. So on a final note, Eric, I would love to ask you, what does it mean to you to be human? You know, I think I'm going to circle back around to the resistance fighter idea. What it means to be human is to be an individual who understands his or her principles and stands up for them in many places around the world. Standing up for your principles will get you killed. So I'm not saying that this is an easy thing to do. Being human is not an easy thing to do because standing up for your principles is not an easy thing to do. But I think that that's the high bar place for us to get to. And that's what being human means to me.